Q&A session um, for a few minutes. Uh, so please uh, ask questions to um, the, uh, the the speakers who came on uh, so far. Uh, so we have Alice and Jeff and Tay. Um, so my first question to Alice, if I if I may go first, uh, is um, the uh, when I first saw your logo, Alice, mm -hmm. um, I, I thought it was Venus of Willendorf. <laughs> You know, I was pretty sure of it, and and I thought, uh, well, for the very similar reason, you know, because um, you know she, she is really the symbol of fraternity, and you know, I mean, it's like thirty thousand years old, but uh, you know, that I yeah. don't know Leo White's in Vienna, but <laughs> what, yeah, what did, absolutely. Yeah, do, do you did you have you ever made that association? Um, it wasn't designed initially to. Um, as in, to be inspired by or to look like mm -hmm. this Venus figure. Mm -hmm. um, I would say though that this round Venus figure like mother like figure mm -hmm. um, is a universal figure and a symbolic across cultures all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in particular for me with Hana was, um, well, there is this question of, okay, well, if she's going to be a woman, what kind of woman would she be? Mm -hmm. And of course, I think from a branding perspective, there was this consideration of, oh, well, maybe she could be like very elegant and sophisticated or, oh, like maybe like she can be sexy even. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't want to go down that route. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe in particular, I'm sure Tay, you would kind of resonate with this now that I've learned a little bit about you, um, is that, um, I don't know, I'm just so against this idea that Korean women are soft, <laughs> when in fact we are actually very, very strong. Oh, very And um, I, I wanted it, uh, it to be symbolic of that, mm -hmm. and it turned out that it was um, Mm -hmm. of the same energy as the Venus figure. <laughs> wow. Definitely. The Korean women are strong. You know, there are stories from um, uh, old Korea that, that the Korean women were soldiers. And there's actually one woman who went to the battle and rescued her husband, <laughs> who was also a soldier. So you are strong. <laughs> For a second. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, any other questions? John, you have a question. Yeah. Hey, Tay, I had a question for you about your about your research, actually. Um, I, I, too, sort of come at, at um, soil brewing with, with sort of a scientific bent. And I'm very interested in it. it is, your, is your thesis work going to be looking at the microbial communities in the Rook? Or what are you specifically thinking to look at? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, I've been researching a few studies that have been done, um, culturing different types of nudic and really interesting ones, um, restoring the ancient, some ancient strains from different parts of Korea. But I'm not in Korea, I'm in plants for germinating, do some experience, um, experiments with different kinds of grain, and then after each one is formed um, in our lab, I can do PCR tests uh, for the bacteria and also yeast to kind of see what strains come up and how they do in different kinds of brews. So it's still in progress, but um, the first steps I've done is basically learning how to do PCR and uh, identifying all these materials, applying for grants so I can pay for all these different things and trying them out so yeah i feel really lucky to be here and also would love to know more about what your research is where should i wait for your presentation well i, I don't talk too much about my research in in my in my presentation i'm i'm actually an, an urban ecologist um mm -hmm. and i have done a little bit of microbial work um looking specifically at urban urban areas urban green spaces um, so soil burrowing is very much my hobby at the moment, but I would be, uh, 
I would be very interested to read uh, more about what you're working on. And if you would like to share your oh, results, I would, I would love to love to see it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I saw the hand go up from the center. Is there any question uh, from um, the main room? For questions uh, for Julia and John. Okay, um, all of our attendees also have a, a, a speaking, a talking permitted here, but mostly. So if you'd like to uh, ask a question, please let me know or um, let other administrators know on the floor in Seoul. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, John? Uh, yes. Uh, so great, great to hear hear your uh, presentation. I'm a uh, I'm very curious that you picked the most you know uh, extreme Finnish flavors, the salmiak and the tar, the pine tar flavors to 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 work on. Uh, how are you going to balance those out in your in your recipe? Those are I mean since those are very extreme flavors. Yeah. Well. Um... <laughs> I mean, I, I think that uh, I think that these are probably going to end up uh, needing to be fairly sweet brews uh, mm. to to balance it out, especially with the salmiaki, uh, mm. since it is uh, it's a, a very kind of weird salty flavor. Mm -hmm. I think that a relatively sweet uh, brew will will help balance that out. Um, with the terva, I I really don't know. Um, it's it's going to. No, I like these flavors. These are flavors I like, but I. They're uh, they're very shocking flavors. They they really are. They really are, um, especially for people that aren't. Well, if you're not expecting it, especially with the salmiaki, it's it's very it's very surprising. There's a whole series of very funny videos on YouTube actually with uh, people being exposed to salmiaki for the first time. It's very a sure. it's a surprising flavor. Um, so I I really don't like I said with the terva. I'm not I'm not exactly sure. I could see it being. Um, I could see it. For, for one that has more of the smoky flavor, if I used a lot of the terva in it, then um, I could see maybe being sweeter would be better, more like the, more like the candies or liqueurs that are traditionally made using that. Uh, but I, I feel like if, if you go really light with it, if it's, it's very little of the terva actually added so that there's just a hint of the smokiness, that I think it might make a, a, a relatively nice dry mm -hmm. part one. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, uh, I have a question posted on the chat window here for Julia. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you differentiate the categories of Cheongju like sake according to the percentage of rice? I uh, yes, as I mentioned, but I also wanted to address uh, something that our, our fellow panelist, uh, Professor Park, also or uh, uh, mentioned before about what we actually discover uh, or to call Cheongju as being saying that uh, Korean Yakju is just a different name for Korean Cheongju. This is what I was alluding to that there is actually a lot of uh, I, I not pre preference to use the word Cheongju or preference to use the word Yakju because we haven't actually got a standardized uh, terminology for it. Uh, but this is simply before for commercialization to register with the tax office. And so that is that is part of the issue of uh, actually what like was what Alice was saying, part of the problem is having clarity of category. Uh, and I actually we we actually call it Chongju, uh, even though we are using Nuruk and uh, we we always refer it to Chongju. Uh, but certainly sometimes I will I'll be at a brewery where I have to check myself and say, okay, well, I will refer to it as Yakju. Uh, because that is what that is the terminology. So it is actually quite murky, to be honest with you. Uh, mm. But according to the tax law, yes, it is about not not about the percent. It is about the percentage of rice for yakshu because it's fifty percent of a fermentable starch. But it doesn't have to be a specific kind of rice. And of course, if you're registering a chongju, then it has to be uh, not a specific percentage of chapsar or mepsar. It just has to use one of the two. Um, but yes, I would actually uh, totally totally agree with uh, with Mr. Park about. Uh, I, I believe that we do need to have a consistency of the category uh, mm -hmm. and a consistency of everybody terminalizing it uh, as the same. Um, and yeah, I, I, I prefer the the word chongju. 
Yeah, this will, I think this will happen same, very similar to what happened in Italy. You know, their, their uh, wine classification, you know, they, they, their table wine started gaining 100 points from, from uh, worldwide critiques and they had to invent a new category of, you know, for their wine classification. And, you know, this usually happens outside. So I think the, the you know, the panelists here, uh, the people who brew outside, uh, we have a lot of work to do, I think, you know, for yes. Korea, uh, yes. because sometimes, sometimes these things happen from outside in. Right, <laughs> exactly. No, they, out. Externally. Uh, exactly. But it is. it can be quite problematic uh, sometimes. Uh, certainly, I say from an education point of view, certainly when I'm introducing the category, uh, mm. You know, it has to be a, a quick shot of explanation. You can't say Chongju Yakju. Oh, and by the way, here's <laughs> ten minutes explanation why these two terms are different and why they're why they're like that. So I do That's hope we get to a consensus at some point uh, of what we do call it uh, as as enough of um, that we can call it Chongju. Right, right. I I also had a question for John. Um, uh, the uh, the pine, uh, what do you call the, the that black stuff? Uh, pine is a pine tar. Pine tar is it, is that a sap or uh, no, it? not really. It's uh, it is the uh, the harvested resin from pine trees, but it's made by actually cooking the trees. Oh, I see. That's why it's so, black. I, okay. Yeah, it's a it's a very right. old um, it's a very old product, a very old technique. Actually, during the the heyday of the mm -hmm. uh, the British uh, the British Empire um, mm -hmm. ruling the seas. Most of the tar that was used to waterproof their ships came from oh, okay. the forests of Finland. Gotcha. So, I mean, what you do is you you cut down whole pine trees and then you basically right. cook them um, without without oxygen. Sort of right. similar to the way that you would make uh, charcoal, but right. at lower temperatures, and that extracts all of the all of the resins from the uh, from the trees. I see. Well, what what I have done personally with the pine was with the pine needles. Uh, when you were uh, cooking uh, rice, uh, you could actually uh, lay pine needles um, on the bottom of the steamer, uh, so your, your rice can be flavored with pine, uh, and then um, you know make chengju with that rice. And and, and the flavor from the pine needles carries over into the rice. Carries over the to the rice. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, that's nice. That, yeah. that sounds lovely. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very subtle, but uh, you know the the, it, the the flavor gets gets through. Yeah, and uh, uh, late last uh, just a few weeks ago, we have a lot of guava uh, pr production in Southern California now. Um, so I've actually used guava, and I dried guava, um, just the, the meat, and then uh, I cooked with rice, uh, and then steamed the rice, and put the entire thing uh, on the tatsu. Right, so I, I make usually a uh, a mitsul, uh, and then I put the dotsul with with that, and and that's traditionally how they have arrived at many a uh, flavored chongju, uh, in in traditional recipe that I have found. Um, I'm sure there are other people uh, in in Korea who could actually uh, share more story about this. Um, was there any other question? I don't see a Q and A here. Okay. Anybody from? Uh... There was a question to John, uh, just ah, about ah. my question. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, John. Oh, if uh, there was a, would, uh, uh, would it be sold well? Yeah, so like if there was like a kit that was available where people could get uh, proper rice and and the rook mm -hmm. here and then, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I it, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Um, there is very limited uh, knowledge regarding uh, this type of brewing here in Finland at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm kind of hoping to help change that. Uh, so I'm not sure how much of a, how much of a market there would be right now. And as I mentioned also, you know, getting things here is phenomenally expensive. Uh, shipping to Finland is, uh, is, is, uh, is, it's prohibitively expensive sometimes. Um, I suppose if you could, um, if there could be a bulk order um, brought in, uh, by sea cargo, that would lower the price quite a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there's also, I mean, like many like many countries, especially in the Nordics, um, the the regulatory hurdles for for selling food products are are quite high. Mm -hmm. And given the lack of experience and knowledge regarding uh, the style of brewing, 
there, there could be some significant challenges to importation of, especially in the Rook. Mm -hmm. Tay, you have a question. Sound on, please. Uh, yes, I do. Um, and on that, actually, yeah, my dad actually sent me a package of Nuruk, and it was all eaten by these little grain beetles in just the, I think maybe it was the perfect warm mm -hmm. weather and conditions, and, or they were already there, but it was a great success for the beetles. <laughs> I, I think I'd send, send the, same, the same batch to John as well. <laughs> yeah, they got oh, in no. mine as well. <laughs> I picked them out though. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's, but that's it's actually, that's actually yeah. one of yeah, one of the Andrew, benefits to brewing Andrew here. <laughs> yeah. One of the benefits to brewing here in Finland. We don't have those. We don't have those. We don't have insects that get into the uh into the grain uh Absolutely. into the grain very often at all. Mm -hmm. so, uh, is it John, is it difficult for you to uh make enough nuruk for your own use? No. Um not really, right? Not no, not really. No, I mean it's um, the as I know you found with with your Nuruk trials because uh, I've I've watched your videos fairly religiously. Um, mm -hmm. The the homemade the homemade Nuruk is is really quite strong, and mm -hmm. so the uh, the sacrification potential of mm -hmm. of these of of my Nuruk I found to be quite high. So I don't need very much um, when I'm when I'm brewing. Um, so well, you, you could a, if you scale up a little bit. You can supply all of Finland with new <laughs> needs. That's that's true. Probably so. <laughs> Just out of my apartment. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. I, I think I see Brandon come on. Brandon, if you can go to the uh, participant uh, window, uh, you could change out your name. I think you logged in with my uh, um, uh, login uh, queue. So that's why you're displaying your name under your uh, face. Um, so if you can just go to uh, push participants and then uh, you can change out your name there. There's a little right, three. I'll dots. give it another go. I'll see you guys yeah. in a minute. Yeah, there's like three three little dots there. You can just do it right there. Oh, just yeah. do it right here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three little dots, and then you can change the. Uh, just click on it, and then you can change the name there. Yeah, it'll just uh, you can delete and and uh, uh, put in your name. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there any other question? Uh, take, have another question? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did, did you have? Did you have? Uh, there's there's one there's one here uh, about promoting. Uh, what is the most difficult thing about promoting Chongju in mm. Korea and abroad compared to Makgeolli? Which is actually a great question. Uh, it's a lot easier to promote anything uh, for Makgeolli or Soju because there's already a reasonable baseline of information, uh, whether it be through media or experiences in Korea, it's far more, even though it's mass produced and it is not necessarily what we would promote, uh, there's a baseline that we can then upgrade them from. Uh, whereas Chongju is definitely this middle ground where uh, the word is very unfamiliar. It's not a, it's not an industry industry even uh, in Korea, uh, as I was saying, in a drinking uh, way. So going to bars and ordering a bottle of Chongju. So that's the hardest part. But I will say that from my experience from doing tasting tours and tasting events uh, and even in brewing classes and things like that, I do notice that there's always a selection of people uh, that rather than Maklin, rather than Wonju or Takju, they prefer Tongju, but they didn't know about that until they experienced it uh, for the first time. So the most difficult thing is just getting it uh, for people to try and to know that it exists as a category. Right, right. Well, you know, the branding is really my cup of tea. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's going to be very interesting how the world will receive uh, uh, this this name, you know, for this product, you know, like I mean, I've, I I would consider Sul as a name as well because you know that's how sake kind of became, you know, the the name for it, right? I mean, sake stands for it, and and sometimes uh, sometimes uh, you know a lot of Koreans refer to this as a Korean sake, <laughs> which is which is almost almost like calling hanbok a, a Korean kimono, right? Which right, right, right. <laughs> is not a good idea. Right? Right. So um, yeah. So it remains to be seen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, was there any any other question? 
thing. Do we have any more time? Are people tired? Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I know uh, it's let's... break also, but I'm I know, tired. I know. Yeah, it is getting late in some places here. Uh, uh, Brandon just came on, but uh, when we uh, came back, when we come back, um, we're uh, we have about ten minutes break time uh, here. And then uh, when we come back, we're going to start our session three on soju. And when we, uh, uh, the first thing that we'll do is uh, uh, we'll have a very short video. This is actually quite a long video, but we're going to show a short one and then send people uh, a YouTube link to see the rest. Uh, and then we have a very exciting talk uh, uh, from uh, Brendan Hill of Toki Soju, uh, something that I've been personally waiting for. So, okay, let's take a short break and we'll come back. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we, we have a question from yeah, attendee here. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, there was a question from anonymous attendee. Uh, why, why, uh, why did you relocate to Korea? Do you have a plan to return to the US? You are back in the US. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm visiting right now. But um, as far as production goes, um, mm -hmm. I think I think that's a maybe. I don't know. Uh, we wanted to, I feel like if we really wanted to change the category and change the way people thought about soju, we should go back to where it started and go back to the roots mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, show, showcase ourselves as a Korean brand um, from the country we're proud of. And I think that was the best way, you know, to have, you know, the home country support what you're doing before you bring it to the rest of the world. I see. Well, I, I think a lot of people would, uh, we were just talking about that earlier. I don't know if you were, uh, you were there, but uh, um, a lot of these changes might happen outside of Korea. You know, I mean, what I you're doing, yeah, what you're doing here is actually very inspiring for, for uh, industry, the Korean industry. As you know, the Koreans drink so much of that green bottle, you know, it's, it's actually more than um, all the other popular um, uh, spirits combined you know right. the entire yeah, entire sales of uh Smirnoff vodka and all colors of uh, uh johnny walker combined worldwide sale is actually less than green bottle soju so oh, um, wow. yeah I, I think what you, you we, what you're doing is very inspiring for it's not it's not because i know what you're doing is very difficult but but i think jillo and uh, uh lotte and all the uh, alcoholic beverage manufacturers in korea uh you know would 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 see a a possibility you know of this higher end soju category uh you know through someone like you i think yeah but okay i don't like to ask all the questions if there's other questions from the from the attendees i would welcome that i know it's getting late everywhere um but uh except for john <laughs> but uh, uh if well tay you had a question tay no? Um, Does anyone from the audience have a question first? Because I've uh -huh. already asked a few. Uh -huh. Go ahead. We're waiting for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this has been amazing. And I guess what I've uh, been wondering about is with all our different stories and homes that we're bringing to this, it seems that everyone is concerned with tradition and getting the image of Su right in the sense of both honor for the tradition and for the drink and everything but also in the sense of the market and how it's going to be presented and branded and sold so um but my idea of Su is uh kind of anti-capitalist just because of how it's history and how it's resisted colonialism over the years and the prohibition war economic crises that came with that it's inefficient to make challenging to transport so um brand and julia also what you have done is really sounds like a lot of work and complicated work and at alice as well but you've done it and i'm wondering how did you decide to go commercial after you were presented with you learned about this and um, relating that to the theme of the conference, how have you reckoned with intangible heritage in the process? 
Yeah, I, I think I think that's a great question. I think it's important. I think uh, for me, I think it it was kind of um, the way that Toki came about was very organic. Um, you know, I did see, seek out how to do um, Asian spirits. You know, as a brewer, I wanted to be more well-rounded. And I think uh, for me, Asia was kind of the Wild West. I didn't know how to manipulate rice. I didn't, I never used the enzymes that they had done, their fermentation styles. So I was very interested in, in learning the techniques, but as far as the brand, you know, kind of what I was um, speaking with about earlier in the slides, you know, a friend of mine was like, would you make our house soju, you know, who was Korean? And I was like, yeah, I, I would love to if, and uh, the, the fact that the Korean community was so behind it and they were so appreciative, um, that inspired me. And then my business partner who was Korean, um, he was one who convinced me that we kind of needed to move forward. And this is something, you know, that was bigger than me and that, you know, should change and, you know, the world should kind of see, you know, a different side of soju. So I think it was more the, the people in my life and the positive response from the Korean community that gave me the, the confidence to kind of to green light the brand uh, and move out here. Uh, yeah, and I'll, to, to answer uh, from my part as well, uh, background change, sorry, getting ready for a meeting, but uh, it was it's very similar to that, actually, uh, and, and I'd echo what Brennan said, that uh, when I started, I, I was saying I was so embraced by the community and I was learning so much that it felt uh, it felt almost like a sin to keep it all uh, secret um, in a lot of ways. So the way, the way we evolved from community to business was very much about communica communication and uh, teaching of the stories and teaching of the knowledge so that the industry can grow. Um, and that's sort of where, where we have always um, just naturally developed into it. We didn't actually, many times people have always said, well, why didn't you start a brewery here? Like, why didn't you uh, go into commercial production? Um, and down the line, I mean, that's, that's totally possible. But uh, in Korea, I didn't ever want to do something personally here because I wanted to be of a different help uh, to the industry in a way. So our, our industry, our, um, our business model just sort of uh, organically moved into uh, education and service model and, and things like that. And also, I mean, my passion is also communication and teaching and um, and I just enjoy it. I actually just really enjoy that part uh, of the work and the job. So um, yes, it is hard. It's always been hard, especially actually, you know, it was something Alice said, I just totally resonated with. She said, yes, it's so great to be the first, but it's so lonely. Um, and I completely understand that because you don't get to sort of have somebody else doing what you're doing to bounce ideas off and to um, know if you're doing the right thing half the time. Um, but still, it's a passion. So, I mean, follow the passion, I guess, is the story. Uh, Brand, I, I one of the questions that I asked you uh, on the email was the uh, your take on uh, the differences between the Japanese version of shochu and uh, the one that you're making. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, soju and sochu are are very different, and I think you know, kind of what you guys were talking about right when I came on. I think the name has kind of a problem with the on the world stage where, you know, soju and sochu, they seem, they share the same, you know, derivative of the Chinese hanja, the so and ju is, you know, burnt liquor, but uh, they're vastly different in many ways, uh, you know, from ingredients to process to uh, the equipment and even how they're consumed. Um, Korean soju, you know, traditionally, had rice, you know, some in the north, some sorghum, and in the south, some millet and barley. But uh, Japanese sochu has, you know, always primarily been like sweet potato, barley, and even in the southern islands, sugar cane, which is, you know, never kind of happened here. And uh, they rely mostly on koji, which is the same mold and same sacrification enzyme as nuruk, but cultivated much different, introduced in the process much different. Um, Korean fermentations are much longer. Uh, you know, because you're constantly feeding the culture like a, like an iyangju or a samyangju where, you know, the Japanese fermentations are what we call a single pitch fermentation where um, lower APV, uh, faster attenuation, and 
Um, even distilling, you know, where the Korean was the ceramic kind of Mongol lamb lambic style stills. Uh, the Japanese actually started with, I don't know if you've ever seen their wood stills, which is kind of wild to, to imagine wood mm -hmm. being a substance that they started distilling out of. But uh, yeah, the Japanese had wood stills. They've kind of gone the way of like vacuum stainless. Um, and then how it's consumed, I think, you know, Korea consumes soju much differently than sochu. Soju is more, uh, you know, in that Anju style has a community around it, um, you know, where sochu is usually a much higher APV. Uh, they, they consume it mostly in chuhais, which, you know, kind of like in the highball style is kind of where it's evolved now. But um, yeah, massive differences across the board. And I think that's the hardest part on the world stage is they get grouped in together like either soju and sake, soju and sochu, soju and baiju, you know, where mm -hmm. there's so many differences that I think the hardest part about sur is going to be the education process around it. <laughs> there you go, Julia. <laughs> right. So um, your tagline, I, I thought it was really quite interesting. Um, you know, when you, when you drink so, uh, toki, you're never alone, or was it something like that? When you drink with the moon, you're never alone. When, yeah. you, when you drink with the moon, you're never alone. Okay, yeah, that was really interesting because one of the first things that I that I was told um, when I was starting to learn about this whole thing from Dr. Lee, uh, who who is the president of the the, the uh, uh, Sur um, Institute in Korea, uh, she told me that uh, Makoli you drink with the whole village, and Chongju you you drink with your best friends, and Soju you drink alone. <laughs> but I guess you drink with the moon. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, that's a, that's a quote from one of my favorite uh, poets. And uh, mm. yeah. you know, there's a lot of like soul culture around. You know, the glass, mm -hmm. especially with makgeolli, where makgeolli, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the bowl, it looks like a full moon, and you have the reflection of the full moon in your cup mm -hmm. and in the water. It just, mm -hmm. you know, they always said it was yeah. your friends. Like our, our whole label is 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 riddled with. Korean traditions from Oktoki to Santoki. It's uh, the rabbit <laughs> bridges the gap between the moon and the mountain. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Oh, got any other questions? Uh, there's a one in the chat window. Was it something? Okay. Ah, I see. Okay. Uh, let's see. I, I think I have stopped uh, the uh, sharing screen already. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, uh, I think you can change the screen from Seoul. Uh, I, I stopped sharing already. Okay. Um, so uh, time is now, wow, 11.50. Okay, so exactly uh, 16.50. Wow, we're on time. How often does that happen? <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, this has been a tremendous and informative session of, of, of for, for all of us. Um, and uh, I think we, we, one, of the, one of the greatest things that we have done is we have actually done a great networking um, around the world. And I really appreciate for those of you who came on in the strange hours uh, on the, uh, around the, the major holiday. Um, and uh, uh, we, we have, um, uh, I'd like to turn the mic to um, uh, perhaps, uh, is Dr. Lee available? Over there. Oh, she's already on the podium. Okay, great. Uh, we can't hear you, Dr. Lee. Uh, 